Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. Eastern session, CME Pecha Kucha, which I'll tell you right now, I'm probably not pronouncing that uh, as it's supposed to be pronounced, but anyway, that's what we're calling it. We're calling it the Pecha Kucha. Uh, I will give a few more details about what that is uh, in just a minute, but let's go over uh, a few housekeeping slides. So uh, our Pecha Kucha session is sponsored by our friends at Educational Measures. We do not have a moderator. Uh, it's just going to be me, and I feel like more like a ringmaster uh, for this than a moderator. Um, so our sponsors, as always, uh, a quick review. Our gold sponsors are Genentech and Platform Q Health Education. Our silver sponsors are CTI Meeting Technology, Educational Measures, iMedics, uh, MedPage Today, and Paradigm. Uh, our bronze sponsors are ASIM, Clinical Care Options, Semiology, Forefront Collaborative, Global Learning for Medical Education, Highmark CE, PVI, Real CME, Thistle Editorial, and Vindico Medical Education. Uh, so you can ask questions during this. It's going to be a little tricky, uh, I'll explain, but feel free to ask questions and we will get to as many as we can, probably towards the end. Um, but the three ways, as always, are our MedPage Today text line, 267-6660-CME. Uh, then you can also click on the little Google Q&A link at the bottom of the video. Uh, you need to have a Google account in order to ask a question, but it's a pretty easy way to do it. Uh, and you can always tweet your question to us using the CME Palooza hashtag. Uh, our speaker disclosure slide, opinions, discussions, conclusions, etc., uh, are our own. They don't represent an endorsement by or a position of our employer, parent company, or affiliates. So what the heck is a uh, Pecha Kucha? Uh, so it was started by, uh, this has come straight from Wikipedia, so take it for what it's worth, but uh, a couple of uh, Japanese architects uh, put it together because they said architects talk too much, um, which seemed perfect for CME. Uh, it is a way of condensing presentations down to kind of like their essence uh, to get people to talk uh, less about extraneous things and get right to the heart of the message. Uh, and so what it is, you get 20 slides. Each presenter gets 20 slides. They get 20 seconds per slide. Uh, the slides will automatically advance on a timer. And I did, forgot to tell the team this, but at the end of each session, they have to end by doing the Carlton uh, dance. So uh, keep that in mind when you're, when you're done. OK, I won't make them do that. Um, so that's what the Pecha Kucha is. Uh, this is a new thing for us. We are trying it. Uh, I'm just putting that out there because there's some technical things we have, we'll have to work with. Um, so I'm hoping it all goes well, but just keep that in mind as we're, as we're going through it. And these five people have been uh, generous enough to give this a try, and they worked really hard on their presentations. I'm honored by uh, the amount of effort that was put into it, so um, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, so these, this is the order that we're going to, uh, to go in. Uh, Mike Lepresti, Senior Director of Medical Education uh, for, uh, with uh, Global Academy for Medical Education, will uh, kick it off. Then we'll turn it over to Audrey Turnell, um, Senior Director of CME at Paradigm. Uh, then Erica Klopp, Director of uh, CME at Reading Health Systems. On to Jacob Coverstone, who is your Chairman of the 2016 Alliance Annual Conference. Go, Jacob. Uh, and uh, uh, finishing off will be uh, Alex Zurisic. How'd I do, Alex? That's pretty good. That's pretty All right. Good. I've had some practice. Uh, Associate Dean for CME at Indiana University. Um, so the way this is going to work, each of them has their own individual presentation. So I am going to have to uh, bring up their slides. Uh, and then once we go to the full screen, they will, they'll get started. So I'll give a brief introduction, and then uh, they'll get started. Any of you guys have any questions before we go? Good to go. I'll take that as a no. So Mike is up first. Just give me one second, and you get to see a little of the inner workings of CME Palooza. I use two laptops when I'm doing this, so you get to see me twice. Uh, and then I'm going to bring up mics. Right. Okay. Uh, so, Mike, can you see those? 
Yes, I can. All right, so Mike is uh, going to be presenting on the evolution of data use in CME. Uh, I'm going to put it in presentation mode, Mike, and then you are off and running. All right, great. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the practice gap that really exists in CME between telling stories and hearing stories. Uh, senior leadership doesn't know about or care about the pyramid, and one of my biggest pet peeves is no one ever asks faculty for their opinion on outcomes data. Both speak to the fact that we are telling stories that others are not hearing or that don't want to hear. So how do we align these stories, and how did we get here? So a quick history, marketing and commercial had a lot of data. Total prescriptions, new prescriptions, RX data that was quantifiable and measurable. We didn't look quite as smart on the CME side. Our data was really limited to butts in seats. And who were those people? We don't even really know. The situation got worse when the firewall went up and marketing and commercial started asking, is CME effective? And really the answer was, I I'm not going to tell you. I can't tell you. There's a firewall in the way. So how did we solve this problem? Well, of course, one of the ways we tried to uh, put our data together was via the pyramid. And the pyramid helped us organize our thoughts, collect our data, align our data in certain areas. And unfortunately, these were all areas that the rest of pharma didn't seem to understand. It's a language that we only spoke within CME. So the question now is, is, we, is the pyramid still relevant? I say yes, but it's certainly not the full story. We have to tell our stories better. And we also now, with the uh, Affordable Care Act, as many have said today, look at the bigger picture, look at the systems, and the, that blue space that encompasses all those individual pyramids. The TELMS model is a model that's been presented potentially to do that. Um, now, there are many, many stories in CME. We look at provider versus supporter, but there are many other stories provider talking to faculty, provider talking to the audience, supporter talking to their own internal stakeholders, and how can we make these stories effective, and can we work together as providers and supporters to align our stories and make sure we're being effective. Some of the stories that we can talk about within medical affairs are we uncovered new gaps, we created new market segments, and we know the needs of each. We've identified new specialty audiences, and we identified the needs of those audiences. And maybe most importantly, we can identify the drivers of behavior change within each of those specialty segments. Brian Russell did a fantastic job of telling stories. At one point, he asked all the providers of RA activities that were supported by Roche for participation metrics so he could turn to legal compliance and say, the activities we supported referenced over 60 studies, they're compliant. He could then turn to the budget holders and say that our trials were seen over 50,000 times by rheumatologists. We are aligned and effective. These were great stories for upper management. CME was having an impact on patients. Data was being seen by clinicians. The CME department, again, is aligned with business objectives. These are some of the things that Brian's upper management wanted to hear, and he told in a story in a very simple but creative way. I worked with Kristen Klein last week at CBI East uh, on a similar topic, and one of the things she said was, top management always wants to know, did we help patients? Compare that with the pyramid, and you can see there's a disconnect there. So how can we tell top management what they want to know, what's important to them? What's that story? Kristen did it creatively through a very, very visual means. Uh, she linked up short bowel syndrome program attendees with the centers geographically. Uh, of where those uh, learning attendees were and where their patients were and showed that they matched. So we were educating the right people who were treating the patients. What stories do we have for faculty and why? Well, we can transform KOLs from scientists into educators and we can teach them how to be agents of change. How can they influence the learners? And in all my experience in working with faculty, they've been extremely appreciative of any kind of direction you can give them in terms of how to educate. I've worked very closely with Sarah Johnson at ProChange, and you may know her through her stages of change model. Using this model, we're able to categorize learners into different buckets and see the drivers of change in each of those areas, and then relate that to faculty so that we can tell them what topics they need to include to drive behavior change. Learners also need to hear stories from us, from both, really from the provider primi primarily. Let's put their learning into context. What do their peers know? Let's show them normative learning. Let's show them the gaps that exist between the data that we've collected from them at baseline and the data that they've used, and, uh, or the, the learning that they've shown. So how do we tell a good story? Five elements. 
character, setting, theme, plot, conflict. We all learn these grammar school. But I'm going to add a sixth, and that sixth is language and the voice that we use. And we really need to match that voice and language to the audience we're speaking to. Characters in storytelling, it's us. It's the provider. It's the supporter. It's also the faculty. It's the physicians and the patients. And the setting that those people are in is important as well. Was it a live meeting, a print supplement? Where was the live meeting held? Was it online? What was the methodology you used? In terms of plot, this is really the story of how we develop the education. We identified gaps, created learning objectives, developed content, and we delivered that content. And ultimately, that leads to the conflict. And the conflict, to me, is when the education reaches the learner. What happens? What are the impact? And here's our outcome story right here. Most importantly across all of these is the theme. My theme here today is encapsulated in these three things I want my audience to remember. Know who you're speaking to and why. Adapt your story and language to each audience. And tell a story with insights and color. Don't just provide a data dump. When you look at the data that we have, a lot of people get lost with the point. For example, 350 symposium attendees is a data point. It is not a story. A story adds more dimension. It talks about the fact that it was standing room only. And here's some pictures of the audience. 90% of these audience members were target specialists. They stuck around for Q&A with faculty for an additional 30 minutes. So let's all make a commitment to tell a better story, a proper story, with insights, dimensions, and color to really highlight CME's value, not just show data. I think we can all make that commitment after today. Done. <laughs> nice job. Was that really six minutes, or was that two and a half? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm going to jump on to the next one for Audrey. And I am going to try out one thing. I'm doing what you're not supposed to do is trying something on the fly. There is, I noticed when you were going through your slides, Mike, that the, our pictures cut off the slides just a little at the bottom. So I think I can actually hide us. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I hid all the participants while I was talking. Okay, I so I'm going to do that for uh, the attendees for the next one. So we will drop off. I'm just letting everyone know so you don't freak out because you don't see us. I'll bring <laughs> us back up. Um, okay. So, and Derek, Derek, one other thing. As soon as you yes. switched to my slides starting to play, I got a lot of feedback in my headset. Oh, did so, you? Yeah. That one I don't know about, but That's you did a stellar right job. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, so let me bring up the next ones here, which are Audrey's. If I can find them. There they are. <laughs> Sorry, Audrey, you're just going to have to do this with no slides. OK. Oh, OK. Um, okay, give me one second. I'm going to make us disappear. All right. Uh, are you ready? I'm good. All right, as soon as they come up, then you can get started. Um, I'm in presentation mode right now. No, I'm not. Hold on. <laughs> and now. Well, great. Well, how challenging is it to get patients to share their stories? It's not really hard at all. Patients are you and me, and we're all really comfortable sharing things about ourselves. We do it every day. Email, text, Instagram, Google Hangout, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, selfies. Now, just in case you're unfamiliar with the term selfie, it's taking your own picture with a camera, maybe using a selfie stick, because you need to share something that you're doing and no one else is around. Scary, a 66-year-old tourist died after falling downstairs at the Taj Mahal while attempting to take a selfie. And more people have died this year from selfies than shark attacks. Now, the Russian Interior Ministry has created public safety advice in response to deaths and injuries from high-risk selfies. And selfie takers are now urged to proceed with caution when photographing themselves with weapons, near dangerous animals, or in close proximity to live wires. Cool selfies. They could injure or even kill you. It's pretty staggering the level of awareness needed around this life-threatening activity. But more importantly, it continues to demonstrate how fascinated we are by sharing things about ourselves. Let me show you about me. And yes, people do like to share about themselves. So stores and organizations, they count on it. 
share your story campaigns are not only used for marketing, but to connect and inspire. New public forums such as People are asking us to share what we know about each other. While Yelp and other social media review sites empower us to share what we know so others can learn from our experiences. What if we never shared our stories? We would miss the opportunities to find others just like ourselves. Would I have negotiated the best price for my car? Without the online review, I wouldn't have known the dress I wanted to buy had questionable quality. The review impacted my purchase. And when it comes to our health, missing opportunities like that is a frightening thought. In the healthcare arena, share your story campaigns, create awareness, and bring people together. I sought the opinions of other parents when I was looking for daycare facilities for my children. Doesn't it make sense to seek the opinions of others when we're faced with healthcare uncertainties? And not just from clinicians, but from people just like us. Now, what kind of impact can a story have? Adding a story to basic facts can totally change our impression of the context of those facts. So let's take the simple math problem 36 minus 29 equals 7. But now let's take the same problem and incorporate it into a story. Bob has 36 candy bars. He eats 29. What does he have now? Diabetes. Bob has diabetes. <laughs> now the first time I saw this image, it made me laugh. But when I was creating this presentation, I remembered it. You see, stories have a way of allowing us to connect emotionally and to be able to recall facts easier. Well, I think it's time that a pre quote make it into the presentation, so I'm going to go with this one. Rudyard Kipling had it right. If history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And as the bards of CME, we have the ability to integrate patient stories into medical education way better than anyone else. Patient satisfaction is becoming more relevant as we move from a fee-for-service to a value-based healthcare model. So here we look at the five clinician-patient touch points that occur during routine office visits. Well, let's design a continuing education activity to improve that experience. One chapter for each of the five touch points. And to start each chapter, two patient stories would be shared. One with a positive experience, the other a negative experience but both demonstrating the impact the clinician has on the patient's overall visit. Now, hearing someone tell you a story and sharing their feelings, it would help you to relate to the facts better. My son made this slide for me because often when you tell people what you're doing, they want to help. He said an injured soldier in the hospital tells people that even though he's injured, it doesn't mean he can't be part of the army anymore. You see, my 10-year-old recognized no one is better suited to help others understand how to overcome quality of life issues better than a patient. And there are so many places to add or integrate patient stories into CMA. Talk to a patient or survey an advocacy group as part of your needs assessment. Start a presentation with a live or recorded patient interview. Incorporate their story as case questions within the activity or develop a sequential learning activity that presents a variety of different patient cases. Some people want to be trailblazers and do the new thing first, but most of us would like some do's and don'ts. So you may need to look for patients who are comfortable sharing their story, explain to them exactly what CME is and how they'll be included, and let them know that sharing their personal story will help clinicians and other patients just like them. Patient advocacy groups work with patients to empower this type of communication all the time, and they're an immensely valuable collaborative resource. These groups can introduce you to some amazing patients who are seasoned at sharing their experience. Patient storytellers. Now, at a conference last week, I was introduced to the term storyology. Australia's storyology conference is for those who write the words to create compelling narrative. People are focusing on the art of storytelling. And it's a professional development area for which our industry is primed to be early adopters. As educational professionals, writing a compelling narrative is exactly what we're tasked with each and every day. So what do you need to do when planning your next activity? Find a patient. Ask them for a few minutes and ask them to share their story with you. Then listen to them and help them share their personal experience with others. Now let's remember, stories are impactful. If the simple words, a little ditty about Jack and Diane, will allow you to remember four minutes of song lyrics, and a song is just a story set to music, realize the power that stories can have on the healthcare teams and patients that you design for. So whether taking your next selfie or developing CME, make it personal, 
when it is, others will want to know more. Create an educational story that you would want to hear. Incorporate a poignant vo voice, maybe even yours. And give your learners a reason to listen, because experiences are worth sharing. All right. Yay! Nicely done. Great job. Yeah, actually, there's something freeing about having all of our little uh, icons being hidden. I feel like I can, you know, who knows what I was, who knows what I was doing back here. Um, thank you, Audrey. That was that was really great. Um, so next, you know what? I'm sorry, I forgot to say the name of your session, but anyway, you got it in there. Just for the record, Audrey's session was the Bards of CME. Where would we be without patient stories? And next up, Erica Klopp, uh, marrying CME and quality. So let me grab your slides. On here. This is what happens when I don't use a mouse. Okay, we got those up. Erica, you can see the slides. I can see them. Okay, let me give. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> let me give a quick reminder, everyone. If you do have any questions, uh, actually, there have been some nice compliments that have come in so far. No specific questions, but uh, you can tweet us, text us, uh, use the Google Plus uh, thing. Um, that's the technical term for it. All right, Erica, if you're all set, I'm going to put it in presentation mode, and then you can get started, OK? All right. All right, here we go. I always hit the wrong thing. So today, I'm asking you to join me in the celebration of joining CME and quality together. It's a story of a perfect match made in heaven and how CME won over quality or at least how I attempted to do it in my organization. And Did we lose her? We really... Um, hey, Eric, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to start you over again. Sorry. Something happened, it cut out, your audio cut out for like 10 seconds, so let's let's start all over again. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> this is why I warned everyone, we're going to do it one more time. And because, you know, it's my conference, I can do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me get it stopped, and we'll just start from the, we'll just start you from the beginning again. I wasn't okay. nervous enough, Derek. <laughs> well, now you've got a run through, so you're, uh, you're, you're going to be good to go. All right, and I'm going to hide this from the beginning. Okay. Here we go, one more time. Take two. How I attempted to do it in my organization and hope it may help you to do it in yours. So when CME met quality, I would say, much like when Harry met Sally, it was not uh, love at first sight. I know in my organization, CME had been around for a while, and quality was this new word, a new group of people who popped up, and I didn't know what it meant or who they were. So in today's world of Facebook and teenage lingo, I would say the relationship status was complicated. Um, I had a lot of questions about what quality meant and what it meant for me. How to reach this happiness in the end of our road with quality and CME and coming together and how we could work our way through that journey to get to our happily ever after ending. But as with anything else, it does take time. It takes time to build relationships. It takes time to foster communications and um, really work together and figure out what you each mean to each other and where you can go from here. So the way I started in our organization is I started to casually run into our quality employees in the hallways. I'd bump into them, start to put faces with names, ask them a little bit about themselves, 
try and figure out the structure of their department, what their purpose was, and who their supporters were within the organization. Once I got the nerve up after bumping into them, I asked them to go to lunch. I thought, you know, let's get to know each other a little bit more. And the more we built those personal relationships, those foundations led to greater business relationships as well. Now, I can't promise you when you go to lunch with your quality partners that you'll have that same satisfaction that Meg Ryan did and when Harry met Sally, but it's worth a try. Um, when you're there, you need to listen and learn. That's your first job with meeting quality. Really hear what they have to say. Learn about what their goals are. Your most useful asset is listening, using your ears, not your knowledge at first. You want to hear what they have to do. Think about it, internalize it, and really figure out what you can do to lend a helping hand to them. So I would challenge you all when you first start those conversations with your quality departments not to ask what quality can do for you, but to ask what you can do for quality. We come to this table, this relationship, with a lot of expertise. We've done a lot of the minutiae in the past of planning activities, booking rooms, ordering food, handling um, the minute details, and they're just new to this area and how to develop interventions and reach a lot of people. So by lending a helpful hand, listening to them, and respecting their goals, you can be the leader in helping them achieve what they're trying to work on in your organization. You may not always understand the road they're taking to get to their goal. You may not always agree with it, and you might feel that you have better options for them. But in that early stage of the relationship, I would encourage you to keep those feelings to yourself and do everything you can to help them. By doing that, you'll find yourselves coming to a common ground. In our organization, that common ground was a project that I learned about that they were working on around pulse forms, which are physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, similar to an advanced directive. With those forms, they had a goal of increasing the number that we had from our patients and our organizations and the conversations practitioners were having. That set off an excitement in me because they had metrics. They had data. They had what I And that helped me along the way. I'm not going to say it was easy in the beginning. I said, educational intervention. I can help you teach people how to do these things to increase your numbers. And they were like, yeah, no thanks. That sounds like work. We don't need to get involved in that. We have our own way of doing things. And I had to really step back and think, but wait a minute. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can work with what I already have. I have regularly scheduled series where my practitioners are ready already scheduled to come to a place at a certain time to learn about new information, to learn about new resources can lead to big changes. We were able to increase those metrics. We were able to have a 42% increase in a two-month period of the number of pulse forms we had on file. We had great feedback from our physicians that they felt better um, able to have those conversations with the patients. So I would encourage you throughout this process, while it can be frustrating developing these relationships, to keep calm and eventually you will be able to show the value that your CME program can bring to the quality department. It's not easy. It can be frustrating. And some people, they say they want it to happen. They wish it would happen. But I would encourage you today to be the one who makes it happen. You offer up to show your to them. And just keep in mind that by doing that, you're going to take those baby steps. We have to crawl before we can walk. We have to walk before we can run. But at the end of the day, it's never too late for you to have your happily ever after with your quality department. <laughs> Good job. That was really great, Erica. 
<laughs> yeah, there cut. There was a couple audio. It cut out once or twice. Um, but we, your slides were so good, we got the gist anyway. For the couple of seconds we missed you, but um, that was really great. Thank you for uh, for persevering <laughs> uh, through that. Um, but it was excellent. So give me a second here, and I'm going to bring up Jacob. And Jacob is talking about Jacob. Why don't you tell? Why don't you tell us the title of your presentation? I don't remember what title I gave you, but essentially <laughs> it's on the role of wearable health data trackers and healthcare. So. Uh, preparing your audience for the future: patients who provide practical, precise, and personal data. I like alliteration. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I think this is yours. Make sure. Nope, that's not it. That's the wrong thing. Sorry. <laughs> Try it again. Stop sharing. Put that down. Cancel. And back to screen share. Clearly we have some... Uh... You know what? I cannot... I'm getting there. Oh, here it is. You, it looks exactly the same from the uh, from the front. That was confusing me. That's my excuse, anyway. There we go. All right. You can see it. I can see that. All right. Uh, I'm going to hide us all. All right. I'm going to put it in presentation mode, and you're re we'll be ready to go. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so hey there. This is going to be a brief introduction because you can't do much more in about six and a half minutes than introducing a topic. But hopefully I'll leave you with a bit to think about regarding the role and potential of wearable health trackers in healthcare. And fair warning, I considered presenting this topic while wearing a tinfoil hat, since you can see me. Um, and there's points where I'll be talking fast. But for a lot of people, this subject is just too far out there in terms of concept or the expected time to market but I'm talking about things that are already here and a future that's rapidly approaching. And consumer health trackers are the pathway to personalized patient care, improved outcomes, and treatment. So increasingly, healthcare is inundated with information and we're just tapping into the potential for data mining EHRs. Quality improvement initiatives are increasing and providers and educators are becoming more comfortable, out of necessity, in using new sources of data. Audio is still there, I'm just waiting. The next source of data is going to be wearable health devices. So Apple, Google, Microsoft are investing heavily in hardware and software, and dozens of developers make up the rest of a growing market. There's everything from devices to monitor what you eat and drink to tweeting your running path. As devices go, smartwatches are taking off, and that's largely due to Apple and Samsung. But smartwatches are effective for reporting and monitoring other wearables, their output devices. The impact of health wearables centers upon input devices, because as Peter Drucker said, what gets measured gets managed. So right now, these products appeal to a niche market, mostly athletes, quote unquote, life hackers, and those in the quantified self movement, and military personnel. People interested in optimizing and willing to pay for investments in small improvements. The kind of person with the means and desire to join a CrossFit gym. The wearable market is just starting its growth phase. It's nowhere near mature. Consumers like the simplicity and ease of use offered by these devices, and currently they're used as triggers or trackers to support current goals, like wearing your Fitbit to track and encourage you to be more active overall. You know, these devices are about improving quality of life, and the motive is there, so the device makers are moving quickly to fill the need. Primarily, we use them to quantify our behavior and allow us to make better informed decisions, but we're moving into a new phase now. This is a product I'm excited about. The Aura Ring, which their CEO is holding up there and you can see behind him, is meant to help users track and optimize sleep, workout, and lifestyle to improve energy and productivity. It follows the principles consumers want, like unobtrusive form factors and supporting a healthy lifestyle. 
Now this ring is an example of what I'm calling the second generation of wearables. These are always on devices that aren't merely tracking data, they're analyzing it and recommending lifestyle changes which will further be assessed and refined. It's becoming a collaborative relationship now between you and your devices. So modern wearables provide rich dashboards and insights into yourself. They literally know when you've been sleeping and they know when you're awake and know when you've been bad or good and help you to be better for your own sake. And I couldn't resist the worst joke in the world there. But the point is these devices are beginning to take care of us now. And if that sounds a bit strange, we already have the Nest Home thermostat that learns your habits and adjusts to your needs, making sure you're both comfortable and saving you money. So 53% of millennials and 54% of early wearable adopters are excited about the future of wearable tech. Now, as we know, the real reasons that are usually listed on these kinds of surveys aren't the actual barriers. So last point first, style isn't an issue. Most of these devices are rather stylish, and industrial design within consumer tech has been prioritized ever since the iPhone became an icon. And cost value just doesn't provide insight. So safety is the real issue. How long is it going to be for these devices to help prevent illness or injury and improve diagnosis and treatment? And secondly, how long is it going to take insurance companies to take notice and provide motivations and savings that outweigh the cost of the devices? Now, culture shifts like this take time, and we're witnessing a similar transition. Self-driving cars are a disruptive technology facing the same hurdles. Public has concerns about safety and security and liability, plus there's established organizations and professionals with interests in maintaining the status quo. All these things stand in the way. And in spite of all that, it's still happening. Ford, BMW, Tesla, Mercedes, and more are developing or shipping vehicles with semi-autonomous systems. Ford expects fully automated cars on the road within five years, and Uber and Google are betting on this as the future of transportation. If just one in four cars had self-driving technologies, travel times would reduce by 37%, Delays would reduce by 20%, and that's because systems like adaptive cruise control are better at pacing the cars ahead. And this is largely what we're talking about, is reducing human errors. Now, a recent push in the wearable device market is for increased accuracy, and anybody who's tried to calibrate a pedometer understands, but essentially, if your measurements aren't accurate, they're not objective. This is being handled. Healthcare practitioners are about to be in a world where patients no longer explain that I've had some trouble sleeping. Patients will provide a log of a month of sleeping habits, including heart rate, body temperature, oxygenation. You know, objective, accurate measures will increasingly replace subjective statements. And this data will be processed in part by smart algorithms to improve diagnosis, monitor treatments, and really move us towards the goal of personalized patient care. The healthcare market is already automating intuitive decision making, but it's about to move beyond the lab. This is a type of patient interaction and diagnostic medicine our learners weren't prepared for. And over the next 15 years, they're going to go from using devices to better inform them to collaborating with these devices to make better decisions like many of their patients already are. That's my talk. All right. Good work, Jacob. Thank you. That was a, that was a fascinating subject, I have to say. Um, and you were did a nice job of condensing it down into a very short amount of time. So that was fantastic. We're getting nice, uh, nice feedback on uh, on Twitter right now for all these different uh, subjects. So it's been it's been great. It's uh, generating good conversation. Uh, so now we're going to move on to Alex and yours up. Yours has a nice red opening slide, so I can find it easy. That's why I sent it that way. <laughs> All right. Um, as long as I hit the right buttons. And share. Okay. So, so I can tell everyone, <clears throat> Alex is talking about a subject near and dear to my heart. What CE, CE providers should know about tweeting the meeting. Um, so, Alex, you can see the slides. Yeah, I'm ready. Up there. All right. I uh, will hit. Presentation mode, and you'll be off. Okay, here we go. Wonderful. So thank you all very much. I'm going to take uh, 
a lead from Audrey and actually talk about my story. So number one, my wife comes from the hometown of John Mellencamp, Jack, and Diane. Number two, today is my older daughter's birthday, and number three, my other daughter broke her arm yesterday. So I am a consumer of the healthcare system uh, vividly as of 12 hours ago. I have nothing to disclose other than that I am the social media editor for the journal JSO, and I really do encourage tweeting of any kind during this presentation. So please tweet away. My Twitter handle is at MedPinDoctor. Look at that, I'm ahead of schedule. This, is, this never happens. <laughs> We're going to talk today about the, the concept called tweeting the meeting. I'm sure people know about this and have heard of it. It is not new, but we're going to describe a little bit about the concept. We're going to invoke learning theory. You know, we're, we uh, understand the theory of education, and we're going to talk about that just a brief bit. And then I'm also going to suggest some guidelines about how we might be able to use tweets at a particular conference that we will host. So the first concept is what is tweeting the meeting. This is basically taking important content that occurs within the meeting, uh, both for those that are there as well as for those that are not there, and sending it out there on, on the Twitter handle via a, a, um, a particular hashtag. Some people call this term the back channel discussion, and I had the privilege of writing about this in a journal earlier this year. The learning theories that have been studied regarding this particular topic of social media and medical education include the concept of connectivism, which focuses on learning across online peer networks, as well as constructivism, which is knowledge that is subjectively constructed by the learner. This includes social uh, development theory as well as communities of practice. What is the definition of communities of practice? It's people who come together to have a, who have a shared concern or a passion for something that they do. It's really collective uh, learning in a shared domain of human endeavor. You can actually then take communities of practice and make it uh, virtual or electronic. So some people will call this VCOPs or ECOPs. This is uh, really the equivalent of facilitating uh, uh, collaboration in an online format. Examples of this might include a Twitter chat. The, the classic example is the MedEd chat, which is Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, or virtual journal. So really the question becomes, why do people tweet during conferences? What is their motivation to do it? There might be lots of different motivations for this. It might be they just want to tell what they ate for breakfast, or it might be they're interested in telling that uh, content and pushing it out uh, in their stream to others who may be following them. So there really isn't a right answer for this, and different people have different motivations. When people looked at uh, those who studied tweeting the meeting, there were two different ways of doing this. This is for providers, and that specifically uh, relates to the majority have felt that the default should be that tweeting is allowed. So in other words, make the, the default is for beta tweet unless the speaker uh, specifically says it's not allowed, versus the opposite, which is it's not allowed. Why is this important for what we do? Uh, well, the biggest thing is promotion. We want to promote uh, the conferences that we will be uh, giving out to our providers. And we want to understand our participants. So the questions become, what do we tell our presenters ahead of time? Is it OK? Should they be uh, ta uh, talking about things that they want to go out on Twitter or not? Some of the proposals of the guide of guidelines that I might suggest include the following. Number one is to tell presenters ahead of time that tweeting may occur and will be encouraged. Really focusing on saying that this is the default and this is what we want to have people do, so that they know about it ahead of time um, when their talk actually uh, might occur. The second one is that uh, the default should be tweet for one, meaning uh, it's okay to tweet. Uh, and, and, and inform the participants if you don't want it to go out. So that means that that, that onus becomes, or that onus goes on to the actual speaker to say, um, if you don't want it, you have to explicitly say that, and that's not the default. So it's really important to understand the differences here. The third one is to specifically discuss permission regarding photos. So when photos go out, is that okay to use that photo in, in Twitter or not? It's so simple to, to take a picture with your phone and have the tweet go out literally within seconds. Um, and if, if you don't want that, then maybe you shouldn't put that picture on there or uh, provide appropriate attribution for that picture when it goes out. And then the last one is to consider providing the conference participants with a how-to or, a, if you will, a Twitter 101 on how tweeting might occur during presentation. So these are some simple guidelines that you might be able to consider uh, when you're uh, using this and, and talking to your course directors about some of the, the programs that you're going to be hosting uh, with them. So it's really, really an exciting opportunity. Obviously, we're in the business of lifelong learning, but social media can uh, be studied within the, the realm of lifelong learning. And that's basically taking learning into a shared space for the purposes of fostering professional growth of those that are inside that space. It also provides an opportunity and a forum for format and reflection for those providers. I want to just give a personal example of this, and this is my own story. 
uh, to end with this the story theme. So this is um, a, a picture from the AMI meeting in France in uh, the year 2012. So I was actually in Chicago on my mother's couch uh, having a lot of Bavarian food and having reflux in the middle of the night. It was 4 a.m. Chicago time. And uh, I woke up and Neil Maida from the Cleveland Clinic actually tweeted out, why should medical education consider using Twitter? I responded to that tweet at 4.15 in the morning with a topic about faculty learning communities that my own institution put on. And someone actually took a picture of this. So while I was on a couch with a reflex in Chicago, this was actually being presented. And there was a picture of me being presented in France at whatever time the equivalent is in France for 4 a.m. Chicago time. So a wonderful example of how we can actually impact others through a Twitter and not just in the same space in which we uh, are physically located, but rather in this particular case across the globe. So um, I think that is it. And I might actually have a little extra time here. But uh, I am done. So thank you very much. All right. Great. I actually, a uh, couple questions for you, Alex, as long as you haven't left yet. Okay. Sure, sure. No <laughs> we can do them while you're at your slide. Uh, no problem at all. Out. So it was actually one question. It was a couple of people asked the same one, basically, which was, who are these people who don't want other people to be tweeting uh, from medical conferences, and why not? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. So when you looked at that survey that was done, the majority felt that it was okay, but some feel um, that this is proprietary information. Um, I don't quite understand, since the whole point of it is to disseminate the information to other people, but it, some of it has to do um, with uh, this can't go out until a certain t time of day or sometimes even an embargo. Um, so I, I personally don't agree with that philosophy. I agree. If you want to present this, then it should be out there for anyone to, uh, to use. But um, uh, that's just my own personal opinion, and obviously these guidelines are not set in stone, but that's why I definitely encourage people to, to write their guidelines for their own conferences so that people understand what is and what is not okay. Great question. Have you, uh, have you ever had any personal experience with someone getting upset with you for, for doing so? Uh, no, no, I personally have not, but I'm, I'm very good about providing appropriate attribution to, to uh, the speaker. So when I, when I tweet, I, I actually will write the name of the speaker. If, uh, if their Twitter handle is available, I'll do that, and then a brief sentence on what, I, uh, what they were talking about. But I, I'm, very, I'm a stickler for always making sure that I provide appropriate attribution, because I'm sending the tweet, but the person is actually the one who came up with the content idea, not me. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, a couple other questions, but these are going to be for the whole group in general, and these are actually <laughs> a little more about the uh, process itself rather than your specific uh, sessions. Uh, so uh, first question is just sort of some general thoughts on this Pecha Kucha process for everyone out there who I'm going to guess that most of the people watching have not actually done one of these. Um, how... The develop, especially the development process, and I guess the actual presentation, but maybe even more so on the development of it. How was this different than uh, a standard presentation that you've put together? Because you've all spoken at, at other things as well, more traditional formats. Uh, was it harder, easier? Did you think it was totally worthless, that it was much better, anything, anything along that line? Um, I'll let anyone chime in. I won't call on you by name. Uh, I can start first, and I know that Audrey and I both went to the uh, web and looked up, I think it's like petrakucha.com, for some ideas on how different presentations are given, um, sure. and it was fascinating, and to me it was a great learning experience and a cool challenge. Yeah, it's tough to not want to put every thought of yours on screen, <laughs> or Derek, you always joke around about having too many bullets on a screen. It's a good challenge to get yourself to stop doing that. I had a lot of bullets on one screen simply to show that there are a lot of bullets, but I, it, it's very tough to do it that way. All right. Yeah, and I'm going to echo Mike's sentiments in terms of hard. When you're auto-advancing your own slides, you often find there's something you want to just throw up because it's going to be there for a second. So sometimes knowing that there's 20 seconds to fill makes you really realize if it's important enough to be there. <laughs> Good point. The other, you know, that I ran into is making sure you don't dwell too long in one area. If there's a lot you want to cover, if you're trying to have that story arc, that you have to really condense it into only a couple of slides. You know, you spend one minute on this portion, for example, and you have to really break that into chunks, find out exactly what's going to be crucial so the editing process becomes really important. Sure. And I'll throw in there, too, along those same lines, Jacob, that it's the transition between slides that I thought were was really important. So you're not telling 20 different little stories, you're telling one big story and you better know how your slides go from one to the next. And that is one, you know, 
But there's two things that go along with that. One, a lot of us, I think, did the, here's a big image, because you don't have to worry about your narrative syncing up exactly with words that are on the screen. As long as the images support what you're saying, that's a lot easier. So if it moves on, or if you have to move on before that, it's not a big deal. Um, at the same time, you worry about if audio drops out or if I stumble, it's moving on without me. And did it miss a critical transition point you know, to what you were saying that now it won't make sense? How did we get here isn't what you want to end up with. So those were in the back of my mind a lot during the prep. I think, Jacob, that's a great point. My, my comment would be Think about what we want the speakers to do. Uh, the phrase that I'm going to use is that this allows us to enhance our own versatility in, in how presentations are incurred. So versatility is a key component. There is one way to make a presentation, and this is another way to think about it and learn about it. So. And I'd also think you're not going to develop this, or I wouldn't recommend developing it in a vacuum. Having other people go through it helps you figure out where your stumbling blocks are and maybe where there'll be a better flow overall, because in the end, it goes way quicker than you'd think. <laughs> and, and practice. I don't always practice my presentations. I said to Audrey, if I had presented this without practice, it would have been an expletive waste program for the first time ever on CME Palooza. Which could have been fun. That could have been fun. Yeah, you got to get your timing down. And when you first, you know, you get your slides there and you say, okay, I'll say this with it. And you realize you're halfway through and there's 20 seconds. That's a wake-up call. And so you start to go back to the board a little bit, you know. Well, let me follow up then, too, with one last final question um, to kind of bring this all together. Could you ever envision a way of using this in a CME program, in a CME environment? Can you think of anything in particular that it might be especially uh, suitable for? I wonder about Grand Rounds. Yeah. I think it would be a great way to present, I thought about it in the Grand Rounds format, Jacob, like you brought up, if there was evidence-based research you wanted to present. Sometimes we get speakers who can go on for 45 minutes about one or two studies, assign five different speakers to do one study each and summarize it in this Pecha Kucha kind of format to present the information and then use the rest of the time for case-based discussion or patient case discussion to tie the whole thing together, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I can actually say that we've done a, a version of it. It's not timed to 20 seconds. Um, called Lit Blitz. It's, it's a resident conference for our pediatrics residents in which one of the faculty members reviews 10 articles, and they do it in, in a matter of an hour, sometimes 45 minutes. And so the whole point is that uh, they go through an article very quickly. They really review. These are the key points you need to know from this article. Um, and it's, it's an appropriately entitled lit blitz or literature blitz. So it's a, it's a nice way. It's not necessarily exactly the same as this, but it's quite similar. I, I've actually done a lot of either poster or you know paper research paper presentations that have a similar format. What's different, I think, about the Pecha Kucha or what did one person call it? Pachaka Cha format. Yeah, no, I think that's actually how you're supposed to say it. Yes, yeah, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> the slide content as well, it adds a different dynamic. I mean, you can riff on your own research for six minutes and get that down, but syncing that with the visual and trying to make that multimedia narrative is a little more challenging. And I think it works actually really well for the Google Hangout format. I think this was a great way to give it a shot. I agree. I think uh, something gives us something to think about. Uh, part of my presentation was consolidating a story for uh, stakeholders and within pharma and people saying that you know we just need a couple of key bullet points. It's a good way to remind myself just to include only the essentials in a presentation. Yeah, no title slides. <laughs> That's right. Hey, it worked out. <laughs> You're referring to I, a couple of people who will remain anonymous emailed me ahead of time asking if they could have 21 slides so they could have a title slide, and I was, you know, the task master said no, 20, and that's it. Um, okay, so we are at 2.54, so I need to wrap this up. But first of all, thank each each of you for doing this. Uh, it was a crazy idea when I came up with it, and you each did it wonderfully, and I thought it was really great and really kind of demonstrated how the value of this sort of technique in that you can get all these, you know, in one hour time we had five different sessions on pretty wide range of topics 
uh, and got some real valuable education uh, out of it in a short period of time. So I thought it was uh, fantastic, and I'm um, thank you very much for uh, being willing to give this a try. Um, the opportunity, Derek. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Thank you. Sure, Derek. sure. Um, so let me finish by saying again, uh, if you haven't already, please go take our survey. It's on the uh, live page of the website. Uh, there's a link right above the video. It's just seven questions, so it should take you much more than 60 seconds to uh, to do. Uh, and we have one more session to go, the final session. Um, grand rounds in the 21st century, fixing a historical model. Perfect segue. Maybe they should do a Pecha Kucha. <laughs> Uh, for it. So, uh, yeah, uh, there's a senator around here named Shaka Fatah, so maybe you should do a fetch it. Anyway. In Machu Picchu. Uh, <laughs> uh, so remember to just refresh your screen, and the next presentation will be up uh, right after that. So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.